Melody Hobson is co-CEO of Ariel Investments and is responsible for managing all areas of the company outside of research and portfolio management. As chair of the Board of Trustees, she leads the company's publicly traded mutual funds. Prior to becoming co-CEO, Hobson served as Ariel's president for nearly 20 years. In 2015, Time Magazine named her one of the world's 100 most influential people. If you could talk about growing up, where you grew up, your, your family, your grandparents, the people around you who helped build your foundation, who were your role models? I'm delighted to do so. So I grew up in Chicago. I was the youngest of six kids in my family. I was really young. <laughs> what I mean by that is my siblings were 20 plus years older than me. And they constantly joke that I was left at the door, <laughs> that I wasn't really their sister. Um, there were five girls and one boy. The closest sibling to me was nine years older. So technically, I'm considered an only child. Because if you have more than five years between you and a sibling, you're considered an only child. Really? So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I'm considered an only child. Well, I guess I guess I fall into that category, too, because my brother's seven years older than me. I never realized that. <laughs> Yeah, I guess at some level of distance, you you basically grow back, grow up by yourself. Now, I had nieces and nephews, nieces, excuse me, that were around my same age. So they were more like siblings than my actual siblings. OK, my mom was a single mom. I'm actually the only Hobson in my family. My siblings have a different father. OK. And so I grew up, you know, just out of the gate different, um, which is not, you know, uncommon in our communities and many communities these days. We had a modern family. And um, my mom was a single mom and she really struggled to make ends meet when we were growing up. And as a result of that, we ended up having a pretty challenging existence. Now, I don't compare myself to anyone else. And, and I know many people struggle, especially when they're children. We would get evicted a lot. Our phone would get disconnected or our car repossessed or lights turned off. Those were the realities of my everyday life. And so it made me desperate. I tell people this to understand money because I felt that if I could understand money, I could make different financial decisions and ultimately have a better life because there was a lot in my life that I could not control. I worked really hard to control one thing, which was school. It was the one thing I can control. So I, I was very, very focused at school because it dimmed the noise of the chaos that was around me. It was the one thing that I could count on. And I also thought school would be my way of having a better life, that I could get a good job and again, understand money and hopefully have more security. So those were the early years. I didn't have any grandparents. I didn't grow up knowing my father. It was really my mother and my siblings and my nieces, the immediate family that I have that really became the nuclear family. And all of them in all of their very specific and different ways are a composite of the person. I became a composite of all of them. Yeah. All of their experiences, things that they did or didn't do became parts of me. And so I, I have a lot of gratitude for the fact that I came last and I could look at them and decide, you know, what I wanted to be based upon the choices that, that I saw them make. And so at the end of the day, that's how I ended up um, being me. I got to go to a really good high school, really good grade school, um, public grade school. I went to a Catholic high school and then I had my sights set at a very young age on going to an Ivy League college, which no one in my family knows even where I got the idea or how I knew about Ivy League schools or anything like that. And inevitably, I went to Princeton. Okay. So let me ask you this. What was what was Chicago like growing up in the 70s and 80s um, in terms of in terms of race, race relations? I don't think I had a really good handle on that, although my mother talked to me a lot about race and gender in a way that probably would surprise most people. I talk about this in my TED talk that I was coming home from a birthday party. I went to a school where I was one of very few black kids mm -hmm. and the school was largely white. And I came home from a birthday party and this was in grade school. And my mother asked me, how did they treat you? And I thought it was the strangest question to ask. Maybe I was seven or eight years old. And I was like, why would 
anyone not treat me well? And she said, they always won't. And she started just explaining to me that I would have to overcome obstacles because of my race or gender, but I also could not use those ob- obstacles as an excuse. Yeah. So I would say the the Chicago that I grew up in was I, I had this very unusual situation of I was um, in this school. I was in this accelerated program. There weren't a ton of black kids, um, but I didn't feel uncomfortable. I don't know how to describe that, but I felt that I had been forewarned so that nothing would surprise me starting very, very early. And I'm really glad my mother was very truthful to me because I have had friends since then as I was, you know, coming into my own as a young adult who I was really shocked when they experienced racism or sexism that they were taken off their game. And that just didn't happen to me. That's interesting. So. You talk about your your, your nieces, um, and then you're also your your siblings. Were there other role models or mentors or even champions gro- growing up who you sort of reflect on, Melody? In my elementary school years, it was teachers. I had some teachers who really invested a lot in me, and they were quite devoted to my success. The principal of my school was also that way. I remember I I won the declamatory speech contest in my school when I was in sixth grade, (laughs) where you memorize something. And um, I won it for the school. I memorized the poem, The Creation by James Weldon Johnson. And um, that meant that I would go to the district and compete against 25 schools. And the principal of our school, whose name was Dr. Mary Shannon, she had me come to her office every single day at lunchtime and recite my speech okay. for about a month. When I mean every day, I mean every single day, That's every right. day. Yeah. And I would do it. And then she would say, thank you. And I would leave. Now that is someone who's invested in your success. Yes. Yeah. So I get to the, the um, big event, 25 schools, we draw numbers for w- what, you know, what, when you go in what mm-hmm. order. So I draw the number and I am last. So I, my eyes well up with tears and you're seated based upon what your number is. Okay. My eyes well up with tears and my mother pulls me aside, you know, very, very gently. And she said, you want to be first or last? She's like, they'll remember you. <laughs> so I thought that was super interesting. Yeah. She's like, this is a great thing. So, you know, really, because you have to sit through the other 24, you know, could, <laughs> could really knock your confidence, right? Yes, if you yes. got some really good ones in there. Now, remember how practiced I am. So by the time I do mine, I crush it. I mean, I really do. And I win. Wow. <laughs> so when I think about from the teacher, Mrs. Hunter, who was my sixth grade teacher who selected the the reading for me to Dr. Shannon, who said, you have to come every single day to my mother sitting there, you know, perking me up when I was a bit discouraged. I mean, that's the classic example of so many people who helped me um, during my my especially elementary and high school career. It was teachers. I didn't you know, I didn't grow up with some family connections, knowing people. I had teachers and I had books and I spent a lot of time reading biographies especially in grade school. I read about other people. People always taught, ask me, who mentored you? And I always say, well, I was mentored by Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Mother Teresa and Nelson Mandela. And I say that because I, I read about them. There were so many people I could tell you I read about that, you know, that would shock you from presidents to Annie Oakley to Louisa May Alcott, who were, wrote Little Women. I wrote, I read all of their biographies. We had these little red books in our school and there were biographies on people and my goal was to read all of them before I left my grade school and I did. Well, those are some great role models. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. So I'm curious if you don't mind me asking because you said you know you didn't have your father wasn't around sort of in retrospect what advantage or disadvantage do you think not having him around you know sort of provided you or affected you, if you don't mind me asking? 
No, not at all. So one of the things that I think about, and I thought a lot about this and, and hopefully not rationalize this point of view, but this is actually what I believe. It's my truth. I say, you know, truth with a small T, not a capital T. But my truth is that um, on the one hand, if I'm, you know, as try to be as intellectually honest with myself as I possibly can, certainly in having someone not choose to be a part of your life, maybe there was a sense that I needed to prove myself to be worthy and to, uh, you know, think through what I perceived as rejection. And so maybe that's what made me so hard driving in some ways in a subconscious way, because I didn't have a lot of consciousness of him because I it just he never existed in my life. So I didn't even think about it. But clearly, subconsciously, I think there may have been something there. The other thing which I only really came to understand when I was an adult, and I think we have wistful ideas of what families are and what families should or could be based upon what we read about or maybe what we see that we romanticize. Mm -hmm. I remember I was with someone who was a teenage parent and that was not my situation. My mother was 44 years old when she had me. I told you how late I was, but it was with someone who was a teenage parent and it, they were with the, the father of the child, both teens, and the baby was newly born. And both of them kept saying, neither one of them wanted to hold the baby. Mm. And I remember being so struck by it. And I actually went to bed that night and I kind of welled up and I woke up the next morning and I thought to myself, wow, I think that baby feels that energy. Yeah. I think that baby knows Neither one of them wants to hold them. And I actually thought to myself, maybe I was lucky that I didn't have someone who didn't want me there every day. So I never felt that. Wow. So it was really a profound moment for me of gratitude, if that makes any sense. Because I said, I didn't grow up not feeling loved. I felt loved. And so maybe absence was better than someone being there and being a different and different or worse. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, th thank you for sharing that. And that's a that's a very powerful realization, isn't it? I mean, that's. Wow. OK, no, th thank you, Melody, for, with that. So tell me then, because you talked about you wanted to go to an Ivy League school and that wasn't something that was really talked about in terms of going to college. Uh, had many of your siblings or your had you had your mother gone to college? Was that something that was really on the radar? My mother, I think, went to teacher's college for a semester or I don't even know. Okay. Um, my mother died a few years ago. I told you I had an older mother. Um, uh, no, it did not. I knew I was going to college. <laughs> so first of all, yes, it was on my radar, <laughs> but it was not the experience of my family. Okay. No, it had not been the experience of my family. In the schools that I went to, college was expected. Okay. I went to uh, St. Ignatius College Prep in Chicago. I mean, everyone in the graduating class every year went to college. So that was just the expectation. And I'm glad I grew up in that situation. Yeah. So then... So was was Princeton your first choice, Melody? This is a funny story. OK, <laughs> this is a little bit long winded, but I'll try to tell you what happened. Okay. So when I was growing up, I used to say to my family, I'm going to Yale. Now, no one knows how I heard about Yale. I have no idea where this came from. But this idea started when I was really young. I'm going to Yale. I'm going to Yale. I'm going to Yale. So I'm now 17 years old and I'm applying to colleges and I apply to a lot of Ivy League schools and I have schools that I know I can get into no matter what, you know, kind of thing. So I have this, you know, list. And so I really appealed to my mother, even though I told you we struggled. I said, I have to go and see these schools. I cannot pick a school just reading about it. I have to live there and I need to see it. So we scraped together money. We flew to the East Coast and we took trains, Amtrak, up and down the East Coast for me to see schools. 
Okay. So one of the schools that we see, we start in Boston at Harvard and Boston University, Boston College, and then we're coming down the East Coast. So we get to Yale in Connecticut, New Haven, and I get on the campus and I burst into tears. And my mother was like, what? I was like, I'm not going to Yale. She's like, what are you talking about? I was like, I don't belong here. I knew I just, I was, but you know, if you had had an idea for like 15 years of your life, which is an eternity when you're a child yes, and the idea that you actually come to see it and then you're, you're wrong. <laughs> devastating. So then so, we, go wait, and- let, me just, let me just ask real quickly. What, <laughs> what provoked that action? Was it the campus? Was it? It doesn't even, I have I have no idea. Nothing's wrong with Yale. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's an amazing school. You know, I, I would have ch- certainly, if that was my only choice, been happy to go there. But there was some kind of reaction that I have that I cannot explain to you. So then we get to New York and we're going to visit um, Columbia, NYU and Juilliard. Not that I play I'm in the arts, but I really, after the speech contest and all of those things, I said, maybe there's something in that regard. So we go and visit my, we get to Columbia. My mom is like, this is Columbia again, has changed so much. It's an amazing school. Amazing. And it was great then. So please don't get me wrong, but a little rugged at the time in terms of the, the neighborhood. So we get to Columbia. My mom's like, you're not getting out of the cab. <laughs> so don't. I don't even go to see it. So then we get to Princeton. All right. So now let's get to the, the, the situation. I get in a lot of places. My mom is convinced I have to go to Harvard because she says that Harvard is like Coca-Cola, that I could say Harvard anywhere in the world. She's like, you could be in an African village and say <laughs> Harvard and people know what you're talking about. She's like, Princeton is like saying Sprite. We only know that in America. No one knows that in the rest of the world. I remember this is 1987. So she's like, she's pushing for Harvard. And a Princeton alum through a long convoluted story, a name Richard Messner and famous Princeton alum, Bill Bradley, the U.S. Senator, Hall of Fame basketball player, et cetera. They convinced me to go to Princeton. And Richard Misner, until my acceptance was due, called me every single day and said, you have to go to Princeton, you have to go to Princeton. And I thought anyone that is that passionate about a school, and I loved it when I went there, and it was a very different experience being in a suburb versus a big city, which is the way I had grown up. I said, just for a different experience in life, I should probably do this because I definitely plan to be a city girl and move back to Chicago or a city like that as an adult. So that is the very convoluted conversation about my college selection. Uh, those are some great reactions. I mean, you know, you up at Yale, your mother uh, at Columbia. So that's that, that. Those are that's pretty. I also had a horrible cold by the time <laughs> we got to New York. So when she said you could, I couldn't get out of the cab. I wasn't even. I didn't even fight because I was. I was so sick. <laughs> We've been on, you know, Amtrak's, and you know, it just yeah. was not staying at really awful hotels. I mean, terrible. We had no money. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that's a great sacrifice your mom made. I mean, and that's, uh, I guess she got up to snuff really quickly about the Ivy League school. So, But it was uh, my choice. And that's where I give my mom a lot of credit. My mother never, ever. I mean, I went on the tours by myself most times. Okay. She was like, you know, she was, it was a bit beyond her understanding and and she went as far as she could to help me but at that point you know it I was making the decisions yeah nuts well no, I, I grew up in Manhattan so I, I know that uh, New York in the 80s and especially you know around Columbia yeah it was it was a little rough so I gritty you know, gritty I, yes gritty <laughs> but I knew gritty I you know I'm from Chicago so it's okay, not like yeah. I was completely you know sheltered yeah but you know uh, well, that's great. And um, cause I, I, I want to talk about Ariel for a couple of minutes, but tell me about in brief was your experience at Princeton. Was it everything you imagined? What, t- tell me a little bit about that, Melody. Yeah, I really loved it. You know, I gave a speech once at Princeton and I said, you know, I arrived on this campus from Chicago, first in my family, go to college, et cetera. And I said, and I felt like 
I belonged. Everyone thought that, they, you know, I would suggest that I felt like a fish out of water or something. I loved Princeton. I loved college. Yeah. Loved yeah. it. I was afraid that I had peaked in college because I loved it so much. <laughs> and I was so happy there. You know, they don't let you stay more than four years at Princeton. If they did, I'd probably still be there. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. No, again, th- thank you for sharing that. So, so fast forwarding, I mean, real briefly, what made you, in terms of the world of, of finance, investment, uh, in brief, how did you, what, what drew you to that, Melody? I wanted to understand money because I grew up not being comfortable and not having the financial security that I wanted. And so I thought, I want to go actually work and do something that will teach me. And so my circumstances created my calling and then made me into an evangelist on the whole idea of financial literacy, because I think we should learn about money and investing in school. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so then, so tell me then about, you've been an Ariel for many years versus president now, you know, co-CEO. What is it about Ariel that makes your company different? Uh, and I don't know whether it's radical, but yeah, different and, and appealing to investors. What do you do? What we do is we invest in companies that are publicly traded. So they're stocks. We buy their shares and we put together portfolios for big institutions, think major corporations or endowments or foundations, but we also do it for everyday people. And our goal is to grow their money, which I think is a noble cause with us. When people retire, they can have a more secure retirement by putting money with us that hopefully over the long term, we can grow for them. In the stock market, there are no promises. But based upon the way that we invest in the U.S., the U.S. portfolios, we invest in small and medium-sized companies that are undervalued, but show a strong potential for growth. And then on the international and global side, we invest in companies around the world that we think for some reason might be misunderstood or where there is pessimism or cynicism around the company. And that creates an opportunity for us to enter at a really great price and ultimately grow our clients' money. The reason I love the company is I love the work. Mm-hmm. I love you know, creating an opportunity to make money for people and telling them why we're winning or sometimes losing because it's not a straight up line when it comes to investing. I love working with my colleagues who are really, really smart and who challenge me. We challenge each other. And then I, I, I love the fact that we created a firm that is very, very diverse, where we really believe all opinions matter and we want all backgrounds represented and we want people to feel like they belong at our company. And so as a result of that, we look very different than other investment management firms. We were the first Black-owned mutual fund company in the country. Um, Really, we, we pioneered so many things and that's been very, very gratifying. Yes. So you talk about, I know financial literacy is important. Does that also include sort of a multi-generational wealth? Certainly. I mean, one of the things that we think a lot about and we've done a tremendous amount of work on is the difference between blacks and whites when it comes to the stock market and investing. We've done surveys since 1998 of people who make $50,000 in household income or more. And we've been monitoring and watching this gap, not only the wealth gap that exists because of the power of compounding by investing, but also what happens in terms of generational wealth that cannot be passed on because it doesn't get created. So we've been trying to be a voice around the power of compounding, the power of investing, and how that not only changes the life of the individual who is investing, but can affect subsequent generations. And in terms of addressing that in our communities, where, where, do, where do we start? Where have you started? Where do you see the, the important place to begin in terms of understanding these principles, Melody? We want investing to be taught in school in America. So we actually have a school in Chicago called Ariel Community Academy. One of our sayings at Ariel is we've admired the problem long enough. 
And our, what we mean by that, no admiring the problem, go and find solutions. So our firm was started by my co-CEO, John Rogers, when he was 24 years old. His father, who was a child of the Depression, my mother was a baby during the Depression as well. His father um, gave him stocks every birthday and every Christmas starting when he was 12 years old instead of toys. Now... You can imagine in the beginning, he says it wasn't very fun. He'd run to the Christmas tree and the only thing he had was a white envelope and it would have, for example, IBM shares in it. But his father was really smart. He allowed him to keep the dividend checks. So he would get this free money in the mail. And so he said he was a 12 year old with cash flow. If he wanted to buy a candy bar, he could. Or if he wanted to buy something, he could. And he started to realize he wanted to reinvest those dividends. He became obsessed with the stock market. Our company is a childhood hobby that became an obsession that became a company. Now, I want and we are trying to recreate that with our school. So what we've done is we give every first grade class 20,000 real dollars to invest, and that money follows them through their grade school career. And our kids take over increasing responsibilities for managing the money. So we're trying to replicate the experience that John Rogers had as a child. We think by teaching them about money and investing starting in first grade, for example, we say to first graders, do you want Barbie or a cupcake to try to show them value? and bartering because they have to decide which one's more valuable to me. These are the kinds of things that we do just even with a, with a first grader. And obviously the economic concepts become more sophisticated over time. But our idea is we're teaching them the language of money, just like you would teach language to a child, hopefully as early as possible. Mm -hmm. And we think ultimately that breaks economic cycles in black and brown communities. That's fascinating. And so what is your what is your aspirations, your goals in terms of expanding this your your school to other areas? What we've done is we've written our curriculum down. It's called Financial Futures, and we'll give it to any school that asks for it. Okay. And so it's appropriate for elementary school students. And we hope that people will take up arms and say, we're going to go and embed this curriculum into the, the curriculum of the school. That's great. No, I I would love to get a copy of that. And I would love to be able to, if it was okay with you, share that with our our partner schools. Uh, I think that would be fantastic. Sure. We'll send you as many as you want. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, No, this, this is fascinating. And so in terms of last question, in terms of the future for Ariel, for you, where do you see, where, where do you see the company and you you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what's sort of the hopes and aspirations, Melody? I hope I'm still doing this. I'm hopefully I'm still on this side of the dirt, which is a great place to be. Um, I hopefully I am. We are just better at what we do. We're always trying to accumulate knowledge to get better. Investing is one of the one areas where you can get better over time because you have experience that teach you how to think about the next thing or the next challenge that comes and allows you to make better decisions. So many things that we do in life, we degrade, we get worse. I'm not as fast a runner as I used to be. I'm not as fast at at so many other things that I used to do because we, our bodies are not as strong in investing. You can actually, and you tend to be better over time. And so that's the goal to do what we do, to do it better, to make money for our clients to create an environment where people want to work and where they feel like they're doing something meaningful for this world and for our society. Thank you very much, Melody Hobson. Um, It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to get a chance to talk to you about your life. And I hope sometime I can get a chance to talk to you further. But this, you know, this, this was wonderful. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. This is The Black Experience for all. If you like what you hear at The Black Experience, please consider clicking on the join button to support our nonprofit. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Thank you for joining us.